Welcome. I'm Dr. Owen Anderson, and this is the Epistemology Consultant Podcast. I'm here with my producer, James Allen. Hey. How are you, James? Good. How are you? Great. Uh, I heard that you have some questions from our audience, and specifically, some people were asking about current events. Yep, that's right. I, 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 I'm spending too much time on Facebook Messenger with people sending me articles and asking me questions about current events. Good. And me being, a, you know, um, um, a Christian and or having certain political views and assumptions that people pile into those things. And um, as you know, there's been some school shootings and yeah. um, um, in the media, too, it seems like they're popping up more. So people are wondering, is the media reporting on it more? Are they happening more? And so, um, yeah, the one thing was, how do you talk to your kids, right, about uh, mass shootings? How do you talk to them about gun control, right? Yeah. So how do you talk to your kids about uh, mass shootings and gun control? Good. And, and you uh, had sent me an article that someone had asked about Yep. from a group called the Gospel Coalition. Yep. How to Talk to Your Kids About Mass Shooting. So let's look at that real quick and, and then just kind of reflect. Now, one thing I want to mention, actually, at the very beginning, a caveat here. Uh, I'm a philosopher, not a politician or a policymaker or a lobbyist. A what else? A disclaimer. Psychologist. A gun expert. Uh, yeah, gun expert, a child uh, expert, but a dad. law enforcement <laughs> yeah. member, right? So you're gonna find you're gonna find articles and suggestions by all of those and more. So what we're doing here on the our podcast is we're we're thinking about these from a philosophical perspective. So you might be disappointed if you say, "Oh, good, he's gonna tell us which guns we should ban." And which ones we should mass market. Well, that's not really uh, my interest or my expertise here. My, my interest is going to be, as you'll see, philosophical. So I think you'll actually like that more as you get into thinking about these discussions and these issues. So let's look at this from a philosophical perspective. How to talk to your kids about mass shootings. And the uh, author talks about his own junior year of high school in Colorado and the experience with the Columbine High School, and that's what got him into the ministry. Yep. So that's interesting that because uh, that's probably, I mean, everyone remembers that one as maybe the first yep. of this series, and ha there's been movies about it, lots of discussion about what could have been done differently or what was done right, what was done wrong, and it makes people stop and think. And for him, he, he, he stopped and thought about life and decided I'm going to go into the ministry. And then he's got kids, yep. five children, and they say, hey, dad, what's going on? So I'm going to read through his points here, and then we'll think about them. What do you tell to a child? Sin and evil are real. So in contrast to maybe uh, hiding those from our children, having them grow up in a fantasy land, you, you yep. tell them, yeah, there really is sin and evil in the world um what do you think about that one i i think that's good um that's the approach i've taken with my daughter she's 11 when these things come up i don't you know like personally i've never uh i've tried to be honest with her appropriate to her age but when she yeah. asks I, you know like for instance hey dad does santa claus like this no you know that's that's fantasy um mm -hmm. i believe god exists and that's real i don't want to lie to you about that small thing then you think I'm, I'm lying to you about something else you can't see. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Like when these things pop up, I see them as opportunities to talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's right. So yeah, a parent would use them as that chance. Now as a, as a philosopher, I already typed it up there, but I was going to say, if I say, if someone says sin and evil are real, a psychologist might respond one way or a law enforcement officer another way. But a philosopher is going to say, well, wait a minute, what is sin? Yep. What is evil? Let me let's see if, if this author answers that and then we'll we'll reflect on ourselves. That's why it's a good um, thing to share because he's a pastor. So he's sharing it from a certain presupposition where he's assuming oh, yeah. things to be true, right? So it, it creates that opportunity for us to talk. Yeah, about. this is on a Christian webpage. Yep. Now we're not presuming our, our audience listening or watching as Christian, 
but that doesn't prevent you from thinking through how would a Christian think about these issues and how might someone else think about them. Um, so I don't know that he defines it here because of that. The reason you're giving is, and you're probably right, is he's assuming a certain audience. And so he just keeps going through and then talk about sin. And then specifically about why murder is wrong. He says it's a stain on God's creation. So specifically uh, murder. So what is murder? And why is it a sin? Yep. Now, so that one might seem just obvious, like, come on, if that's how philosophers spend their time, count me out. But what we're doing and when we're asking that kind of question is trying to get a clear understanding of these concepts so we can apply them correctly, not just kind of a fuzzy intuition that everyone is slightly different on, on their intuitions. Yep. So I'm not suggesting murder is okay. I think, I mean, the very definition of the word murder is a wrongful killing. Yep. And, that, and that, that's kind of why I thought these articles in this particular case from a Christian perspective in America would be good because isn't part of the problem where we're, we're assuming things to be true or that yeah. we all mean the same things. We find out actually we don't. Yeah. And then because it's Christian point three is that God is still sovereign over evil. And, and especially God works all things together for our good, for his ultimate glory and plan. He even mentions R.C. Sproul. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And Romans 8, 28. I like that. R.C. Sproul is yeah. a well-known reformed uh, pastor and theologian. But again, this is a, I'm not, we don't want to unfairly critique this article because this is just a quick article, a five minute read within a Christian context. So he doesn't explain this, what I highlighted. God works all things together for our good, for his ultimate plan. But we need to, we need to raise a question about that just because um, does evil present proof God either does not exist or is not sovereign? So, and, and those in one way go together. If there's God and he's not sovereign, then it's not really God. Right. And then uh, four pray and share hope. Now this one really riles people up thoughts and prayers, right? Yep. They'll say, stop saying thoughts and prayers. It's empty. Do something about it. Yeah, take action. Yeah. Take some action. So uh, is thoughts and prayers empty. And, but again, as a philosopher, I would ask, well, what is, prayers i think thoughts and prayers gets added in probably then by the non-religious yep prayers is the religious so i'm really going to focus on that one because the thoughts is like well the, i'm not religious i don't believe there is a god but i'll be thinking about you yeah like i care it's sentimental yeah. like yeah. i you know but it's not going to help anything and they realize yeah, so, that so they'll say this with prayers you know same thing that's just you're praying to, to uh imaginary friend in the sky all right so if we're taking the idea, and you, you correctly pointed out, this is helpful. I think it, as a parent, I think the same thing. Telling your kids about the reality of the world. This seems to be a really early question that you would tell them about age appropriate. I'm not talking about a, a baby, but you, you talk about sin and evil and how they're real, which I think any kid is going to ask, well, what's sin? Yep. Right. I think that the, the word sin would be uncomfortable in a non-Christian setting because evil is something that you can define in relationship to each other. But sin in, brings in God. You've yeah. sinned against God, not just against another human. And so to define sin, you'd have to first know if there is a God or not. And I, I think that's going to be a question behind a lot of this. Uh, what is God? In fact, that question comes before what is sin? What is God? And is God real? Can you sin against God or not? Now, I, I mentioned up here that I'm not a policymaker 
And I think a lot of the question about gun control right now in our society is a practical question. What do we do? And so then you'll get both sides. And I'm not going to advocate for either side or settle the differences. But one side says more guns in the classroom. And the other side says fewer guns in the classroom. And then they'll argue about the practical question, which one of those will result in, in uh, less tragedies, fewer tragedies. Yeah, fewer tragedies. So that's a practical question. What do we do about it? And it's a great question. I'm not suggesting we don't get into that because philosophers will be critiqued with having their heads in the clouds and just thinking and not doing anything. So we should do that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest there's an order, a logical order. We, we can't successfully address the practical until we've addressed the philosophical. And someone could object and say, yeah, yes, you can. You could have, you could have no, no school shootings. That's been solved, and you don't know what God is. Okay, I think that, yeah, but you, you wouldn't have solved the other problem. And I'm wondering, James, can you guess what the other problem is? Knowing what sin is? Knowing what evil is? Yeah, you wouldn't have addressed that. And both what is God and what is sin are part of another problem that humans face. And it's not initially a practical problem, although it does get worked out in practical ways. But what, what's the big question you humans face? What, what, it's my, what's, what's the meaning of life? It's yeah, life. and, and meaning, that's what you'll be teaching your daughter question. about, right? Yeah. yeah, the existential question. What is the meaning of all this? I'm going to say of life. The purpose. So that also comes in. That's why I added psychologist up here is you'll also, whenever you have gun violence, you'll have a discussion of mental health issues, right? Yep. And, and people saying, well, we should do much, much better in the United States on mental health issues. Now that's not that, that I put that under psychology and psychiatry, not philosophy, because that could contain uh, physical ailments, Right. And, and as a philosopher, I'm not addressing those. I'm only addressing the philosophical side of that problem. And that is just, yeah, what's the, what's the purpose of life? My life is empty. Now, let me give an example from the novel Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Usually that's high school, like junior, senior level reading. So you're familiar with it. And here you have a city that has gotten rid of all crime and inequality and suffering. Things are going really well, but those weren't sufficient to make life meaningful. With none of those things, life was still empty. And so what the government of the city had to do was add in a happy drug to the drinking water called Soma. And so not only had you addressed crime, inequality, uh, labor differences, suffering of all kinds, you have to give people a drug or they'll start to realize their life is pointless, meaningless. And the, the leader of the city says, this drug, Soma, replaces the older idea of God. Soma is God. Soma is specifically Christianity, because Christianity gave a kind of hope. And without that, you don't have any purpose to live. So as a philosopher, what I notice is that even if we get all these other things right, and I'm not saying we shouldn't get those right, I'm not suggesting you only do philosophy, so don't misrepresent what I'm saying. But even if we got all those right, we still have this other pressing question. And in fact, the author of the article, I'll toggle back here, speaks to that. Yep. 
The tragedy of Columbine was one of the catalysts for my preaching ministry. As countless classmates wondered where to find hope amid such loss. Where do you find hope? How do you teach your kids about hope? Well, if you solve all these other problems I have up here, you still haven't addressed that problem. And that's what I was a philosopher when I bring into it. And, and for this, this author, it made him be going to Christian ministry. And I, I recognize he's assuming certain things for his audience, but as a philosopher, it makes me want to question those things. Well, what is God? And what exactly is sin? So let me give an example of how to bring those together, especially number one and number two. The very fact that we ask the question, what is a meaningful life, shows that humans are, I'm going to use the word rational, but that's an often misunderstood term. So I'm going to use, I'm going to put it like this. Humans want understanding. I don't think anyone, especially with understanding, would deny that. With, with rational, it often gets pigeonholed into like, the rational and the feelings and they'll say no we're not rational we're feelings but i think with understanding we recognize that as a broader term yeah humans want to understand and we want to understand why this happened what do we do about it but we also want to understand what's the meaning and purpose of life and so de to dehumanize another is to treat them as one who cannot understand right? And you might even have words like, you're stupid, or you're a fool, or even even worse, bad words that people use to say something like that to each other, right? You can't understand that's dehumanizing. And we object to that. I mean, I think if you were treated like an animal, you would object. I'm not a, a brute beast. So this could also be done to yourself. You could dehumanize yourself. By not treating yourself as one who can and should understand. And what do you want to understand? The meaning of life, the basic uh, truths about reality. Like, is God real or not? And if God's real, why doesn't God do anything? And what is sin? And what's the purpose of uh, doing what is right if people who do wrong things are rewarded? So what if you've gone along, James, in your life, and you've never really tried to answer those questions? You've mostly treated yourself as a consumer of pop culture or a consumer of uh, internet information or a consumer of fun times. Well, you'd expect that your life would be empty. You dehumanize yourself. And some people, that might make them lash out. Others might just become depressed and not leave the room. The individual responses to it vary, but the basic problem is the same down here, which is the lack of meaning. So the up here, well, I was doing the, explain the hand motions. Up here is the way you respond, the way an individual person responds, but underneath that, supporting that, and the same for all people is not having meaning. Yep. And so you've been involved in murder. Murder is not primarily or not only, I should say, the physical act. Murder is the dehumanizing of the other or yourself. Self-murder, suicide. So you've already been involved in doing that by treating yourself as less than a human. Can I ask a, a question? Yeah. Um, so like if we were talking to this pastor or others, um, part of the reason why I thought this was interesting is, is because of the path you're going down. 
-hmm. So for instance, if I make a declaration that God says not to murder without understanding in that commandment, yeah. Jesus in the New Testament, right, also draws out that murder, adultery, and these other things are a lot different than what people thought they were. It's They're not spiritual. Just the, it's not just the don't. It's there's also a positive flip on that. Yeah. And the Westminster Confession, Shorter Catechism, also teaches us there's two sides to this. It's not only what you're not supposed to do, it's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Scripture does also, right? And so that's, you know, a lot of that's what Jesus's ministry was, was drawing this other aspect of the law. And it seems like what you're getting at is thou shall not kill. But then what is the opposite of thou shall not kill? What's the positive? What should we be doing with yeah, this promoting affirming life? People. Yeah. And so I don't know what, well, let me, what do you think I think you're that? right about that. hundred percent. Right. Okay. And you also, you, you, let me connect the dots here. You're basically, we're showing how what I just covered here yep. is from the sermon on the Mount. When Jesus says, you've heard it say, do not murder. Yep. But I tell you, if you call someone uh, this name, you've murdered them in your heart. Yep. So he's also, or, or what I'm doing is following his lead of saying, murder is not just the physical act. Yep. But I want to add one more thing to that, which is the law is spiritual. I think that's also what he's getting at. It's not just a matter of actions. It's a matter of understanding and so the law, the moral law, is the path of life. And by saying that, I'm connecting up the word life with the word spiritual. It's what directs us to how to understand the basic truths I was just mentioning. So that's the purpose of the moral law. So when we talk about what is sin, what is evil, well, we mean Sin is a violation of the moral law. You've done something contrary to the moral law. And so we're defining those. Now, number three is really one of my specialties. And for those listening, number three is, does evil present proof that God either does not exist or is not sovereign? And I do have videos about that topic on my YouTube webpage. That's going to be... Th that takes some time to discuss, and that will take us beyond this current episode. But there are other resources we've already covered, and I'm sure in our in our podcast we'll come back to that one eventually as well. But you can see how in order to answer number three and then number four, you'd have to, which is about prayer, you would have to begin in the order, which is, well, what is sin and what is murder, and how do we address them? So I've come at this as a philosopher. And not as a, a politician or policymaker. So I'm not suggesting, based on what we've talked about, any specific policy. But I am suggesting that what we need to, to teach our children and what we need to have for ourselves is a meaningful life. Yep. I think, I think yeah. the example you gave with Brave New World was great because yeah. um, that's an example you could give to your kid too. Even if we solve everything, it's not going to get back to meaning. And, you know, the article started off with Columbine and on a practical, just on a practical note, this isn't, this isn't, this is just to, you know, me to be the uh, non-philosopher here, right? Yeah. Not that I don't love wisdom, but um, Columbine happened during an AR-15 ban. Yeah. And, and so I'm saying like, you can't blame the gun on that one. And so, yeah. and so there's, there's something more going on here because Prior to Columbine, there weren't mass shootings. There was yeah. nothing like Columbine. And since then, there's been more of them. Yeah. So, I mean, like, there are practical differences in time. So things have changed. And so the question is, what's deteriorating more and more and more and more over the few years? When my dad was in school in Texas, he was able to put a gun in a locker for a shooting club or keep his gun in his car. Yeah. So I'm just saying there's, there's massive differences with generations. So you may have some people, well, they took prayer out of school. Okay. That also could be true, man. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like they, there was this, there was this decline, right. It becomes a, a purely secular place. Right. And so the question is if it's secular. And you're not allowed to address no any big questions like the meaning of life. And I think that that's important to include when we say that like, well, prayer got taken out of school. They took the 10 commandments out of the, you know, out of the courts. I think what people are trying to say by that is you can no longer talk about spiritual things, which yeah. means you can't ask the question in school, what is the meaning of life? What's our yeah. existence for? Can we, you can't even do philosophy. 
However, right. though, l- that's right. But let me play the other side of the same thing, which is that if you have prayer and the Ten Commandments and they're just followed out of blind tradition, they increase the meaninglessness. That's what Jesus was correcting with the Pharisees. So, yeah, so you'd have to have understanding of those. And a lot of times it's almost as if the Ten Commandments or a prayer for a minute at the beginning of class are viewed as magic talismans. If we just do this, I just slap up the Ten Commandments, then that produces something. But presumably you could have the Ten Commandments up and not have the correct application. The Pharisees are a good example of that. Yeah. Or you could not have the Ten Commandments up, but have the correct application. So the, the issue is how to understand them and how to apply them. Yeah. And so I think that's part of what the secular was revolting against. I, I, I agree. And was uh, fideism. And I think that's something that you do really well in your work is that you don't just do philosophy. You also do religious studies and study history. So you're always studying the how ideas, you know, are, are uh, being challenged through history, right? Yeah. And so we can see that. And that makes sense. And so for me as a Christian, you know, and, 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 you know, trying to apply, um, how to have these conversations with people who don't believe the same things that I do. Right. It gets back down to this idea. Well, I'm not going to use, I may not open the Bible to someone who doesn't believe in the Bible. I may want to go back further and use general revelation to say, Hey, yeah. how do I have this conversation with somebody who maybe disagrees with me? But yeah. then get back to what we both have in common that we agree on right now. Not that the Bible is not important or God, you know, for me, God's revelation is important, but it's, there's a foundation that has to be laid to have that conversation. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That's a good I, point. Yeah. So it's an, and I'd like to have the 10 commandments up and people understand them. You know? Yeah. That's uh, um, for me, I'm good. Yeah. That's interesting. What you just said is great. Cause we'll have a whole discussion about this. Do we need a physical thing? up front and james knows where i'm going yeah or can we just be based on the spiritual understanding yeah and so that's a great question for for us to talk about in a number of areas here in the law right and then it also comes out in in worship and how worship has been done in the uh, established church and the uh dissenting church so that's a great topic we'll we'll come to but for now we we've been looking today at this discussion of uh, gun control and kids and bringing it back to this existential problem about the meaning of life and how we understand the moral law. So thanks for joining us uh, on the Epistemology Consultant podcast and hope you'll join us next time.